Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, it seems that according to the number of people here, most of the people are rich already and don't need any money. Anyway, um, who has some open source project? Okay, and uh, who has some open source project which is actually used not only by yourself? Nice. Um, so why am I giving this talk anyway? Uh, I'm the author of three open source projects. Uh, the first one is uh, more or less popular. Um, the second one is also doing good. And the third one was, uh, well, it was a mistake. It's not used by anyone. But anyway, it was an inter interesting exercise. Um, so at some point, I started to think, uh, if I have a successful open source project, maybe I can make some money out of it, right? So just to give you a brief idea about this uh, Python Redmain project, uh, it exists for three years by now. Um, it has uh, 255 stars on GitHub, which doesn't seem to be a lot, but it depends with what to compare because, for example, the most successful um, PHP client for Redmine uh, exists already for five years and has 500 stars, so I think we're doing good there. Um, there, are, um, there are approximately 70 unique uh, visitors per day, and uh, yeah, and around uh, 9,000 uh, downloads per month. So as you can see, really nothing special here. I mean, any one of you can come up with a project like this. So I still was able to make some money with it, so let's see what uh, I've tried. So uh, at first I decided to try donations, the most obvious choice. Uh, I remembered this nice buttons that I saw in a lot of projects, and uh, I thought this should work, an easy way to make money. So I registered at one of the services, uh, put a, a button on the, on the w w website, and uh, linked the readme file, and uh, I started to dream, dream about money. Um, so I waited one month, two months, three months, nothing. I didn't receive a single donation in three months. By the way, did any one of you ever donate to some project? Okay. Um, so I thought maybe I'm using the wrong service and uh, I registered at another one and uh, the result was the same, nothing changed. And uh, no one even tried to contact me saying like, uh, hey Max, I tried to donate but something didn't work, you know. I was really depressed. And. Uh, I didn't know what was wrong. I mean, a lot of people claim that they receive donations, so unfortunately I didn't succeed. But in the meantime, people were uh, opening GitHub issues and the uh, download counter was growing, so everything was fine, but still donations didn't work. Uh, I don't know why. I don't know what was wrong. Maybe I just didn't have these nice users in my user base. So let's go quickly through pros and cons uh, of donations. Uh, first of all, it's the, the easiest way of receiving money and uh, it can be tax free if done properly. What properly is heavily depend on your country so you better consult with your tax advisor. Um, but this is, uh, it comes at a cost. So actually it's not really free uh, because these donation services uh, ask you for a fee per transaction, so let's say if someone donates you one euro, you'll receive actually, let's say, 70 euro cents, for example. Um, so some of the services require you to be a non-profit, registered as a non-profit. Um, some of the services don't accept payments from all over the world, so some users won't be able to donate at all. And uh, finally, uh, in most of the services, you will need to have a bank account in US or so-called uh, European Union trusted countries. Um, so if you want to go with donations, choose your service uh, wisely, read the terms and conditions carefully. So donations didn't work for me, but I didn't give up. Um, 
I decided to add another possible source of money, sponsorship. So how can this work in theory? Um, this is very rarely happens, but uh, a company, if a company is really heavy user of your project, uh, they can suggest you a permanent full-time job to work on your project. Um, a company or individual can pay you for implementing a specific uh, feature that is very urgently needed. Or you can offer extended support for a small fee, like 24-7 uh, support by phone, for example. Speaking about pros and cons, uh, the good part is that you will have established relationships. Uh, you will have an order from a customer and uh, if you do job, your job properly and on time, uh, the chances are very high that you will receive more uh, requests from this customer again. The bad part is that this will be considered as an income, so you will have to pay taxes and uh, also you now will have obligations. So if before this project was just a hobby for you um, and uh, you could devote as much time as you want to, to, to do, uh, now you'll have deadline for some specific feature to be implemented and you'll have to manage more time more carefully. So, um, yeah, regarding, regarding sponsorship, um, I put this uh, link, also information that I am ready, I'm ready, please send me requests. Um, so I'm a very patient person, I waited for one year, no one contacted me ever. Actually, it's not really true. There was one guy. Um, he contacted me and he asked me to implement something, but uh, then we, he just disappeared. Um, so yeah, it didn't work for me as well. Um, so the next thing that you can do uh, is to, to use advertisement or negware techniques. Uh, so the idea is simple. You registered some uh, AD network like Google for, for Google AD, for example, and uh, put a banner on your website, and uh, you just earn some money when someone clicks on it. And uh, you can also add these negware techniques in your project, meaning when a software constantly, like let's say, pops up some window asking to pay uh, to get rid of this win window, or you can insert some random timeouts or some other weird things which can annoy your user and uh, make them pay. So regarding pros and cons, uh, everything is obvious here. Uh, it's very easy to do and it's basically a do-nothing income because once you set up everything, you just need to wait uh, for money to come. But on the other side, it, it annoys user, your users and uh, you may lose them completely. And this, of course, will also be considered as an income, so be prepared to pay taxes. Uh, I didn't try to, didn't try this way of making money because I don't think this will be appreciated by my users. So I started to search for something else. Another option of making money is collaborative funding, uh, which is very close to donations, with the only difference that in collaborative funding you uh, raise funds for a specific feature to be implemented or a specific bug to be fixed. Um, so there are several projects that successfully use this way of making money. Uh, like PyPy or uh, Django REST framework, and a lot of projects uh, raise, uh, raise funds on bounty sources platform. So, uh, yeah. Um, yes, regarding pros and cons, um, it's the same as donations, plus you have uh, obligations here, because if uh, you raised some funds, uh, of course people expect you to implement this feature uh, or fix this bug by a specific date. This is also something that I didn't want to try because I already had a very bad experience with donations. Um, so finally, this brings us up to a freemium model. The idea is very simple. You have a free version with uh, some basic functionality and you have a premium version with uh, some additional features. And uh, you know why this finally worked? So this is what I will talk about next. But because it's not that simple as it sounds. So uh, regarding pros and cons of this freemium model, uh, there are no obligations, no deadlines, uh, you're the boss, you decide when and what to release. Uh, you can choose a proper payment gateway, and uh, which means that 
if you choose the right one, uh, you will be able to accept payments from the worldwide and uh, you will be able to set up some additional payment systems and uh, instead of the usual Visa or uh, MasterCard only policy, which a lot of services have. Um, and you will also be able to set up uh, uh, prices per country. For example, if you want to support people in Africa, uh, you can set up a very low price for them, which will be controlled by checking that the card was issued in this country. And uh, of course, this will be considered as an income, and uh, you have to uh, pay fees for the payment gateway. Either per transaction or per month, it depends on the gateway policy. So, uh, we decided to go with this freemium model. Now we want to find out how can we restrict our free version. So the most obvious is to make it feature limited, uh, meaning some features will only be available in the premium version. Uh, it can also be capacity limited. Uh, let's say you're writing some data processor tool and uh, you can restrict the free version by only processing files not larger than one gigabyte, for example. Uh, another option is to limit support channels. So let's say uh, your users uh, only receive support uh, on GitHub with free version or and uh, with the premium version you add the ma email or telephone support or users of free version don't receive support at all. Um, you can also add a seat restriction which means that this, uh, the, the free version can only be used on one computer but not across the network. And uh, you can introduce storage space limitations, which is suitable for software as a service model. Um, let's say you have an image processing uh, service and uh, it's open sourced on GitHub, but uh, you can also host it yourself with a nice user interface and uh, users can upload files, let's say only for f five megabytes uh, with a free account. And there can, other, can be other restrictions as well, of course, uh, that just depends on the, the product and uh, your fantasy. Uh, for my product, I choose, chose uh, features, uh, feature restrictions and support limitations. So the next step is to figure out the, the licensing problem. Uh, the common approach here is to go with dual licensing. Uh, which means that there are two licenses, one for free version and the second one for the premium version. Uh, so I suggest you to have a look at these two websites. <clears throat> the first one is from Open Source Initiative, uh, which lists almost all possible licenses. And the second one is from uh, GitHub People, which is a very nice and intuitive user graphical interface, which can help you to choose the right license. And you can also see here a list of uh, most popular licenses. Uh, for my project, I chose uh, Apache license, which is also used by uh, Python requests. Uh, Django, for example, uses PSD3, and uh, basically you need to invest some time into reading all these licenses to figure out which is, which is right for your project. Uh, after we chose the license for the free version, uh, we need to choose a license for the premium one. This is more complicated. Uh, but there is an easy way. Uh, there is a nice uh, license generator, uh, which you can see on this slide. It's just a part of the form, and uh, you just need to fill the form, and you will get the generated license. And if you feel paranoid, you can just insert some fake data and then just modify it on your local computer. So the next question is how can we, how are we going to distribute our product. With free version, it's easy and obvious. You just upload it to PyPI. Um, but how to distribute the premium version? So uh, the answer is to host a private PyPI server with authentication. So there are different options uh, available for this purpose. Some of them has, uh, have more features than others. Uh, because we, we just want to start selling and uh, we don't want to invest more time into setting up this PyPI service. Uh, we don't know how good our sales will be. 
I think there is no point into going with uh, any of these options. Uh, there's an easier way. Uh, so we're just going to use Apache as our private PyPI server. Uh, what you basically need to do is to create a PyPI folder in the root, uh, create .htaccess file with uh, contents shown on this slide, and uh, depending on the Apache version, you may not need the last two lines. Uh, and you need to create a folder which has the name of your project and put project related files generated by setup tools inside. And we'll also need a .ht password file uh, with access data for our users. Let's have a look at it quickly. So on the left side, we can see a HT password file with uh, access data for 16 users. This data is encoded uh, for Apache to understand it. And on the right, we have uh, an access data for the same 16 users, but it's not encoded. This is what we will give to our users when they will buy our premium version. So now the question is how to generate these codes. This the quick and dirty implementation of this generator. Uh, you need to specify the amount of codes you want to generate, uh, the the path paths to HT password and the file with clean passwords, and that's it. You basically run this generator code uh, once and until you reach the specified number of sales, you don't have this problem anymore. And uh, you upload this generated code to the payment uh, gateway, which will do the distribution for you. And uh, here's an example how we can uh, use our new private PyPI server with pip. Uh, basically, it's absolutely the same as our standard pip installed. You just have to add minus i option. Um, to, to tell PIP that it should access our private uh, PyPI server and not the public one. Uh, this approach with Apache server uh, takes five minutes to set up and we can use Apache log files to track the user activity. And if we, if, if our sales will go really well, we can just uh, add a full feature each PyPI server transparently for our users. So. We're almost done. Uh, the last question is how or where to sell. So the easiest option is to sell at some online marketplace. Uh, the problem with this approach is because not many people are trying to sell their Python projects, there is no Python specific mar marketplace, or at least I wasn't able to find it. And uh, usually marketplaces charge you more per transaction or uh, introduce uh, additional fees because they don't have their own solutions for uh, payment processing. So they need to pay some payment provider their fees. And uh, yeah, there's also limited customization options and limited options to withdraw money. Basically, you will only have only one option just to monthly transfer money to a bank account. So the next option is internet acquiring. Uh, this is usually provided by your bank uh, where you have uh, your bank account. Basically this is just a page where user enters uh, the, uh, the card access details and press the buy button and transaction happens. Uh, the good thing about internet acquiring is that you will have the lowest possible fees, uh, but there are other problems. Uh, first, this is a very low level solution. Um, which means that you will have to write some code to integrate with this. Um, and because this is provided by your bank, usually only cards are accepted, uh, meaning no PayPal or other options, and uh, usually there are no customization options available at all, and uh, the money, when, when money, money will go to your uh, account in this bank, and that, that will be the only option that you'll have. So, and finally, uh, our winner, it's the payment provider. Um, the integration is very easy. Uh, usually you don't have to write any code at all, uh, though most of the providers also give you an API if you want to implement some low-level integration and to control all the aspects of integration. Uh, there are usually several options uh, provided to withdraw money. And there are a lot of customization options available and a lot of different payment methods. But fees are usually higher than internet acquiring or, uh, but, but still uh, lower than the marketplace ones. So let's have a 
brief overview of some of the payment providers. <coughs> so here we have a list of some payment providers uh, together with the, the value they charge per transaction uh, if your customers pay with uh, Visa or MasterCard. Uh, value charged usually depends on the payment method used by your customer. So let's say if you choose uh, Braintree uh, and your customer will pay with American Express, they will charge you 2.9% instead of 1.9. Or let's take Paylane, if your customer pays with American Express, uh, here they will charge you only 15 euro cents without any per percentage. But for, uh, for JCB, for example, which is widely used in Japan, uh, Paylane will charge you 3.6% plus 25 euro cents. So you'll really have to choose your payment provider carefully. You have to read all these terms and conditions. And uh, regarding, for example, uh, Avangate, uh, it, it has the, the highest fee, but the thing is that uh, they work with almost all the countries. So for example, if you are in Russia, most of these providers won't work for you, but Avangate will, because brave people work there probably. Um, and Avangate also allows you to send your money to a special prepaid MasterCard option, uh, which is provided by a company called Payoneer, which gives you a number of interesting opportunities as well. So fitting it all together, the, the first step is to develop a premium version of the product, then to prepare project licenses. Uh, then you need to register a domain name and set up SSL certificate for it because without that a payment gateway uh, will refuse to register you. And uh, also if you won't have HTTPS support then people won't be happy and you will have to add the special trusted host option. Then you need to set up private PyPI uh, and upload your premium version there. Um, next, you need to sign up for the chosen payment gateway and upload your uh, generated codes there. Or you can also set up a dynamic access codes generation mechanism, which if it's supported by the payment provider. And you can finally start selling. So what will happen when someone wants to buy your product? Uh, they will, uh, they will fill in the payment details and then they will receive an email with uh, uh, instructions how to, uh, how to download, how to install the application, your package from your private PyPR repository. So your customer can just copy and paste this and install the package with people as usual. So what if you don't have a project? Uh, create one. Um, I mean, don't be afraid to try. Uh, when I started my project three years ago, I didn't have an idea that I will be standing here in front of you telling you how I succeeded. Uh, it takes some time, of course, to success, for success to come, but just find the right idea and uh, be patient that it should work. And that's it. If you have any questions, ask. Thank you. Thanks, Max. Very interesting presentation. Many questions. Mm. Hi. Um, what do you think about the bounty source model? Do you think, because as far as I can see, it's not very used. So do you think it's the model that it's broken or the website, the service? Well, uh, good question. <laughs> good question. Um, yeah, I also noticed that it's not really, really popular and not really used, but still, some projects use it. I don't know. I mean, from my point of view, the model is nice and right, but I don't, don't know why people just don't use it. Hi. Um, I also had a dilemma of how to monetize open source. I actually earned two euros in donations and all my career as open source developers. And I want to ask what you think about the ethics of uh, SAAS software as a service, if you've tried that, and what you think about the model for open source ethics. That's uh, what I mean. 
um, the can you can you repeat uh, the do you, last do you part? Have like like open source is kind of like having like an ideology, and I want to know what's your opinion about like doing it as a software as a service as a, as a cloud uh, software service. as a service. Yeah, yeah. Uh, actually, I like this this idea uh, very much because, as I said, uh, I mean, I gave an example so you can open source uh, the like the core maybe of the project um, and on GitHub, and then you can uh, implement some nice service for your users on top of it. This way, you will have uh, so you will have a lot of users in the open source community who will send you patches and fixes maybe for your bugs, and uh, I know some projects that use this model successfully, so I think it's, I mean, it's nice. I would also use it, but I just didn't come up with the right idea. Okay, uh, I was wondering what about bitcoins or stuff like that for payments? Uh, have you thought about it? Does it work? No, I didn't, didn't think about that, and uh, I didn't see that I mean, didn't see any payment provider that supports it. I'm sure there are some, but I didn't really search for them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay. Say in the yeah, I, I did. So just, <laughs> yeah, I heard. You don't, I mean, you can use a payment provider, BitPay or stuff like this, but you can also just give your Bitcoin address and send mm -hmm. me something. And so you yeah. wouldn't need a payment provider. And so you don't pay a fee or you don't need a bank account or anything like this. And people from all over the world can send you money without currency conversion issues. So, look yeah, into it. Maybe, maybe something to consider. Thanks. Okay, uh, we don't have time for more questions. Uh, you can, of course, ask. You know. Let's thank uh, again, uh, Max, for this very interesting presentation. Thanks, Max. Thank you.